It's America's first national park, home to natural wonders and plentiful wildlife, and it's 150 years old this year. But instead of celebrating its birthday, Yellowstone National Park is facing huge challenges during the summer of 22. That is insane. Oh my God. In June, relentless rains and torrents of water through the park, washing out roads and bridges, toppling trees, and sending thousands of tourists running for safety. In this episode of Let's Talk, we chat with someone who knows Yellowstone like the back of his hand. He's lived here for decades and witnessed the wrath of Mother Nature. What's open, what's closed, what's next for the flagship of the National Park Service and a favorite to millions of visitors each year. Let's get started. Michelle, a longtime realtor. I'm her husband, Mark, a television news anchor. Together, we've started a podcast. And we want to hear from you. So, let's, let's talk. talk. Michelle, we spent the last three or four summers up in Yellowstone, so I think we're a little bit familiar with Yellowstone National Park. We thought we were. We thought we are. <laughs> but our guest today, by his estimation, has been in Yellowstone National Park thousands of times. Right, right. Uh, from what I've read, his family uh, has been visiting Yellowstone since 1919. He's going to correct us if we're wrong here. That's more than 100 years. He's been going to Yellowstone for more than 50 years. So he knows a little bit more than most people about Yellowstone National Park. Teddy Garland is our guest today. Welcome, Teddy. Hi, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and, you've, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later. You have a podcast and a, a guidebook by the same name, Explore Yellowstone Like a Local. That is correct. That is correct. We are the number one downloaded podcast for Yellowstone Park and uh, now the top, top selling guidebook for Yellowstone Park as well. So, so what does that title mean then, Explore Yellowstone Like a Local? Oh, we've had the guidebook for over 20 years and it started out real simply as people that were friends of ours that were going to stay at our cabin during the summer. You know, they'd get up there and they'd go, well, well, what do we do when we get there? Well, you know, do we just drive to Old Faithful and watch Old Faithful go off? And I go, no, no, that's that's not what you want to do. Here's what you want to do. So we started writing down some notes just, just on Word and, and faxing it to people 20 years ago because that's what everybody did. And um, after a while, we started to add some pictures in, into it. And um, a good friend of mine here in Oklahoma City owned a graphic shop so he said hey I'll, I'll be glad to bind a couple books up for you and you can hand them out to your friends we got five or ten books printed off and and then it got you know word got around into in West Yellowstone and around town people would see people carrying the book in the park and go, where'd you get that and so it just evolved over about 20 years and then the funny part about it is it was uh, pictures of, of my ex-wife was the one that put all the pictures in. So there's a lot of pictures about me and my ex-wife in there. And when, she's uh, okay with that? No, absolutely <laughs> not. So that's what that was the emptiness no. for all this is uh, Lisa, my, my partner for the last five years, she... Uh, we had some bad weather in Oklahoma City during the winter, and I'm in the landscape contracting business in the, when I'm back in Oklahoma, and uh, she said, you know, why don't you go up there and work on that guidebook a little bit? And, uh, and you know, the, the hint was is to get rid of all the pictures of me and my ex-wife. and So I rewrote the guidebook over four or five days, and she goes, you know, it's really good. And she redid the pictures. She goes, we ought to sell that. And I go, well, where, where would we sell that? You know, where would we sell the guidebook? And so... She goes, I don't know, why don't you do a podcast? And I said, what's a podcast? And, uh, you know, this is four years ago. I had no idea. I have never heard a podcast in my life. So I bought a microphone and uh, jotted down some notes. And I knew I wanted to do one thing in Yellowstone Park. And it's what kind of in the guidebook started out with, you know, 20 years ago was sending people to certain areas in Yellowstone Park because Yellowstone Park is so big you have to break it down into areas that you can do in one day or you just you know you wear yourself out slick I, I, I can't tell you how many times when I was growing up as a kid we would 
be driving through the park and see people sleeping in their cars because they've just bit off too much in one day. And uh, so that was the main impetus of the guidebook, start to break Yellowstone Park into manageable bites that you could do in one day. And we started, uh, you know, selling some guidebooks and doing the podcasts. And before, I thought when I first did the first podcast and I was walking out of the print shop up here in Oklahoma City with about, I think, 25 guidebooks, I said, you know, these are going to be great fire starters at the cabin. I didn't think we'd sell a <laughs> single one. And so, and it's turned uh, out a little bit more than that, hasn't it? Oh yeah, we're 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 our, my goal is to sell ten thousand guidebooks a year. That that's that's the goal, and and the, and sixty percent of our sales are electronic, where people just get it downloaded instantly to their phone from our website. So yeah, as long as you got you a good will, signal, you can just get it pops up on your phone instantly. You you mentioned your podcast, and I discovered that last year, and I. And you remember Michelle that I I would say hey you got to listen to this yeah it was I funny. mean it was really good yeah your podcast is not only informative but it, it is hugely it, entertaining it's funny yeah there, there was this one story you were in Jackson I guess spent a lot of time in Jackson younger yes. and, and yes. when you were younger and you, you did some table surfing at a bar there you remember that one uh yeah that's that was probably one of my more memorable memorable evenings and uh, uh at at the old rancher bar which was kind of catty corner yeah. That was the million, million dollar cowboy and uh, yeah the uh, the table surfing uh, extravagance I still have I'm still amazed that, that hadn't caught on as a as a bar sport in the United States but when it does you'll you'll know you heard it here so you know and, and you got an escort out of town right with oh, the, um, the local oh, yeah. place I got escorted yeah. out of the bar I, I didn't get my rancher staff shirt that I was promised uh, because we brought uh-huh. over a load of people from the million dollar cowboy into the rancher didn't get the my staff shirt and uh, got summarily thrown out of the bar like in a wild western uh, into the onto the boardwalks of Jackson Hole in front of a whole bunch of people who promptly helped me up and uh, the sheriff was sitting over there on the fender of his car chewing on a toothpick just like you'd see out of a movie and he just goes come over here and so went over there well, it, and uh, started talking to him it sounds like you've him, uh, so. led an exciting life it's a oh, great yeah, story it's, yeah, it's I, mean, great. I highly recommend your podcast let's get into uh, what's going on in Yellowstone right now? Of course, this is a big year, 150th birthday of Yellowstone National Park, our first national park. But it's facing huge challenges right now. And, and last month in June, they had some major, major flooding. Uh, you've been up there many, many years, for many years. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, I, I, I haven't. You know, this in the spring was just different to begin with. We, I got up there May 12th. And uh, I bet I didn't see the sun for three, two days out of 35. It just rained and drizzly and cool and snow a little bit. And, uh, and it just kept on coming and kept on going. So, and when it's rainy and drizzly in West Yellowstone or Jackson Hole or Mammoth or wherever, that means it's snowing up high on the high peaks. And uh, I'll tell you something I'd never seen before. We were driving over when Dunraven Pass opened up. They opened it up on a certain date, and you can do the North Loop. We pulled up Dunraven Pass, and we're shooting some videos up there. And I was looking up behind uh, Lisa, who was filming me real quick, and I looked up there, and I go, there was people had parked their cars and had walked up the side of this hill about 500 yards and were snow skiing down on some of the hills coming up down Dunraven Pass. I've never seen that in my life. And that was in That's early funny. June. It was nuts. I couldn't believe it that there was wow. still that much snow. And then mm-hmm. it started to rain. It was unreal. I couldn't believe it. But what happened was that when it rained, all the snow started to melt. And uh, it just pulled the snow down with it. And it, on top of the rain that had just... I mean, you literally couldn't see a hundred yards for hours. And, it was uh, the perfect storm. It was a perfect yeah, storm. Yeah, I've read they call this a thousand-year um, rainstorm. I've um, heard that. And I've heard a hundred-year yeah. event, and then I've heard a five hundred-year event, and I've also heard a thousand-year event. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll buy, I'll buy off on it, all of them. So it, yeah, it, it we're, was we're just showing unreal. some um, showing some video now. The National Park Service did a lot of aerial. Uh, shots of all the damage you see roads that are uh, washed out bridges that are toppled homes I guess some employee 
uh, buildings were were swept into the river. It is just amazing. It, it's unreal. I mean, they're they're just abandoning the road. The road from Mammoth to Gardner is only about five or six miles long, but it ran right next to the the Gardner River, not the Yellowstone River, but the Gardner River. And uh, the Gardner River kind of ran past Mammoth, and then it went down this little valley, and then it kind of zigzagged back and forth, and. Uh, but the road ran right next to the, the river. Back in the day, when uh, stagecoaches and horse-drawn carriages, a, a few people died in that area. They would be, be up at Mammoth and go back down at night, and their horses get spooked. They'd be drunk. I heard a number of stories about people being drunk, and they'd fall off their horse and fall in the river and die. But that little section of road down through there was, uh, you know, right along the edge of the river and it's just gone that they're just abandoning ship on it they're going to uh, move the road west uh, about a few blocks because there's an old abandoned stagecoach road uh, to the west that they'll connect Gardner back up to mammoth but you got to remember though they, they they can only work about six or seven months out of the year because the ground freezes solid and then it uh, you know the snow and everything else I mean, it literally took them three seasons to, to just resurface part of the road from Dunraven Pass to Tower. I think it's going to take two to three years to get that road rebuilt. And um, I, I don't know what's going to happen to the people in Gardner I, I, because they rely 100% on, on tourist traffic. Correct me if I'm wrong, most of the damage was in the northern part of the park yes not the southern part yeah all right? up on the northern end the north loop of the park yeah the set the like grand tetons on the south end of yellowstone just untouched and then yeah. uh basically there's a little bit of damage around old faithful but it's on the secondary roads it's not on the main road and then um you know what they had to check on the south loop uh because we listened into we listened to cam shawley's he did a uh, uh what would you call it? A, a PR or announcement? Every Cam that, Sholley, the superintendent. Cam of the park. Sholley's the superintendent of Yellowstone Park. He is the head guy, and uh, I'm telling you what, that guy has got his head on straight. And as my dad used to say, he is smart as a tack. And uh, I mean, he hadn't slept at this one interview for I think he said four days, and it, he he sounded like he was ready to go take a, 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 a Albert Einstein test. And so, yeah, he, he, he was, he's got his head on straight, I promise you. And, uh, but, you know, he said they got to check the roads. they got to check all the, he's got, in, had engineers checking out the bridges. Yeah, he, he, he's got his head on straight. So they're, but uh, and, he, he and did a great job. It, it's a miracle. There were like uh, 10,000 visitors in the park. They all had to be evacuated. And no one, from what I understand, was killed or, or even hurt. Uh, it, it's an absolute miracle. Wild Country Safari. Every year we go up to the Lamar Valley, far northeastern part. I know you know where that is there. We camp at Slough Creek. Yes. We're kind of remote campground. We go up there to see the, the bison, the bears, the wolves. The wolves. We saw yep. them all last year. But that that's off limits right now, isn't it? That's um, You can't get up there and camp or the, the roads are washed out. Yeah, nobody knows what the, what the situation is. But, um, yeah, in a nutshell, I, I had understood from listening to Cam Shawley speak before the park opened back up that he thought Slough Creek was going to be able to get open back up, at least to a certain point. But we just checked this morning, and uh, it says on, on the National Park website that the Slough Creek area from basically Tower up to the northeast entrance road is going to stay closed for the rest of the year. So they've, they've obviously got some serious damage up there, unfortunately, because that is, uh, I'm with you guys, the, that lower Slough Creek Valley with the, the boulders, the, the giant glacial strewn boulders through there and the bison everywhere and the wolves everywhere, it, it's just a magical spot. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were going to go up there again this year. We had reservations there at Slough Creek, and uh, what we do every year is we, we rent uh, one of these Mercedes-Benz Sprinter vans I in know Jackson about. from Motera. We cheat. We cheat. We don't really camp. <laughs> we love Glamping. That. Glamping. I mean, yeah. That's yeah. right. It's, it, have you heard of that company up there? I have. It's very, and those vans are very nice. I, I get behind yeah, them and get frustrated nice. all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we were going to go up to Slough Creek again, and we were going to spend more time, like a whole week there. 
So, and then after this happened, we thought, yeah, you know, we, we, we love Grand Teton. That's yeah. that's our favorite spot. Yes. So, but we've been going there every year, so we thought we tried something different. So we're, we're abandoning um, Yellowstone and Grand Teton going up to a Glacier this year. Yeah, yeah, and Glacier's nice. We were at Glacier two years ago, and uh, yeah, Glacier's really pretty. Uh, the, the thing about Glacier, it's, it's like I, I considered it like going to Zion. You know, you start at one point and you go up to the top and then you kind of come back down. And uh, we rode bicycles up it. And uh, we got up to the top about, well, about two thirds of the way up the top and the road was closed due to a snow slide. But it was beautiful. But it's, uh, you, if you spend two days there, you've seen the whole thing. <laughs> so, what would you advise tourists to do this year as far as going to Yellowstone after all this uh, devastation there? Should they like us maybe scrap their plans go someplace else or uh continue on and 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 go to the park no i i, I think i did a my last podcast i did that i updated uh, i think it's the perfect time to go because the crowds are so far down because everybody thinks that the park's washed out or this is done or this is you know you can't go see this and you can't go do that so a lot of people aren't coming i actually ran into a couple from Positano, Italy, and uh, just they were walking down the trail, and they seemed a little lost. And I was standing right there, so I started talking to them. And uh, they said that they had, they were already there, and it was right when the park had opened back up, just the South Loop, the North Loop hadn't opened yet. And they were kind of asking me where to go, and I was helping them out. And they said all of their friends that were coming later in July and August uh, had all canceled their trips. Hmm. And uh, and I said, you know, there's you know, once that North Loop opens up, there there's no reason for it. But um, it's like the after it's like in 1989 after the fires of '88, because nobody came to Yellowstone Park because everybody thought the park was all burned up. But it was awesome. You could see you were driving down the road and you could see for 15 miles where you normally couldn't see 15 feet because of all the trees. Yeah. So there, uh, but there were and there was no people. That the, the park yeah, was down I, on 60 percent. It's gonna I, it's down 40 percent now. Recent. I read that recently that the park is saying that they're seeing something unheard of this summer, cancellations. Yes. So there, there are, there's opening, there's no shortage of workers this year, there's, there's plenty of places to camp. Does that mean we're changing our mind? I don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I kind think of so. uh, second guess myself for changing our, our plans. Yeah, and all of the, I, I spoke to a ranger before I did my last podcast and uh, talked to him. They said they have, there's out of the, 400 or so campsites, backcountry campsites, uh, where you can go hiking and spend the night out, you know, like in a tent and all that stuff, go hiking. There's only four that are closed. They, they, all the rest of them are open. They have inspected them all. They've inspected the trails. They've done this. All those are open. And uh, the Madison campground, which was closed right there when you leave West Yellowstone and go to Madison Junction, where you guys would go to, to, to glamp, <laughs> is, uh, yeah. yeah. Is uh, that's opened up, and then they have now opened up the uh, camping area at uh, Fishing Bridge, which is brand new. They got a brand new visitor center, brand new uh, Hamilton store there. Brand, you can go in and get. They've got a brand new place where they cook hamburgers. It's really top notch because the Fishing Bridge area has been run down for ever since I worked there as a kid when I was seven years old. It was kind of janky, but they have just rebuilt all of this stuff, and. The parks and the, and the visitor visitation of the parks down forty to forty five percent. I th- I think it's the time to go. Yeah, but I've never been to Glacier, well, so I, I need to just see it. Well, you're going to see it in forty eight hours. <laughs> I know you're ruining my experience already. <laughs> we'll, we'll, be, we'll be back next year to uh, Grand Teton and Yellowstone there. So I thought we'd just talk a little bit about our experiences that up there in Yellowstone. One of the reasons, as I mentioned, we love the Lamar Valley. What do they call it? The Serengeti of North America. Yeah. Um, you know, all the wild animals up there. And and remember, Michelle, that we would see so many bison yeah. up there that we go, we're sick and sick tired. Sick and tired. Sick yeah. and tired of bison. And we, we did a podcast last year about that. And so here's, here's a clip on that. So if, if we had a safari tour company... We call it maybe Bradshaw Safaris, and we'd have a slogan Mm -hmm. saying, guaranteed to see a bison. Right, it'd be called Bradshaw Safaris, so BS. (laughs) (laughs) 
and guaranteed to see a bison <laughs> because bison. they're everywhere. Yes, they're everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, and so much still, everywhere. I don't want to see another we, we bison. Ignore them. Yeah. They they take care of their herd. I watched this big guy, and he was um, taking care of a baby, and the baby wouldn't go over the the road, and he just walked back and fucked that baby in the butt yeah. until yeah. until the baby and would go across the. And road. they make noises too. Don't oh, they? they snort. They're so loud. Oh, those, those uh, buffalo went way out there. Like they left the herd. Yeah. They're like, enough of the herd, tired of my click, getting a new click. It's funny, we see I totally get we, that. bison everywhere, but you see a single bison here, single there, and then you see mm -hmm. a dozen here, two dozen there, and mm -hmm. a single over here. And it's like they're, they're like literally people. everywhere. They're like people. When they get sick of them, they go find another group. <laughs> it's pretty funny. It's probably very true. This road is awesome. Hi there, buddy. What's going on? So, but guaranteed to see a bite. But they're funny to watch. So, that was, that was pretty rad. <laughs> it was swell. Yeah, groovy. <laughs> One thing I mentioned in that um, that that clip there was turons, you know, tourist morons, and there are a few of those um, in up in Yellowstone, aren't there, Teddy? Oh, there's uh, there's more than you can shake a stick at. I promise you. <laughs> and this year especially, it seems like people and there the, the the park service is warning people not to get too close to bison, but people aren't getting the word. People lose their minds. Yeah, they're stupid, aren't mm -hmm. they? Yeah, there's, uh, there's no shortage of videos of that, but uh, when I was up at old, the Old Faithful area uh, at the end of June, and uh, I just went up there to mess around, I was actually doing some hiking up Myst to Mystic Falls and all that, and I decided to go up to uh, Old Faithful and see if I could catch Grand going off or something else real quick. And I stopped at the Hamilton store there, and uh, over by over by the old the old Faithful Inn, which is where you want to park when you want to go watch guys go off. And uh, there was a ranger there, and a number of bison, two or three big bull bison, big bulls. I mean, they're as big as a, a Volkswagen Beetle. They're huge, and they were on the walkway, but the bison was about 20 feet off. Well, you know, and he's he's watching, blowing his whistle, keeping everybody away from him. Well, I get back to the cabin at 2 o'clock, and Lisa goes, you got to see this video, and it's right where I was. The ranger takes a break for lunch. Somebody walks out there in the grass and gets behind the bison so they can get a picture, and that bison just finally has had enough and gets up and chases a couple of them, catches one of them, flips him in the air about 10 or 12 feet in the air, and then goes over there and stomps on him. And if that bison gets him in the right spot, it's going to kill him. And, uh, oh wow! But yeah, there's more people get hurt by bison because they think they, they they just treat them like they're a cattle or something, and they're not. Yeah, they're and, and wild I saw this animals. Yeah. Th this one video recently, I think it was even last Sunday, came last Sunday, of the like two dozen tourists that were just walking on a hill next to all these bison, and a park employee took the video, and it was like these people are stupid, ridiculous. What the hell's the world come to? You don't understand that that's a wild freaking animal. Yeah, it's 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 really bad. And in, in the front of the guidebook, we uh, we were asked by the uh, the uh, 
the uh, magistrate, the head magistrate, which is the judi judicial system of the park. And because we were reaching so many people with our podcast and with the guidebook, uh, they asked us if we would insert some uh, some verbiage in our guidebook to help people uh, police the park in the moment with their phone. Because the park service is just strapped for funds and employees and rangers and all. They're just they're just spread they're spread so thin they can't keep up with it. I mean, when you got ten thousand cars a day and there's an average of four people, there's 50,000 people a day going in the park, and you've got what five rangers on the with boots on the ground. They just can't keep up with it. So we, we put some information in there at the the request of the uh, park service to you know we put a website in there that they can take a picture of somebody doing something stupid, get a picture of their license plate, and then send it into this website, and then they will go they will get prosecuted by the magistrate. They're going to get when they get home about three weeks after they get home they get a, a letter and say you know you better hire an attorney and, and they'll do a video conference like we're doing now except it'll be for a court court file. That's uh, good fire. to know. Yeah, it's really good. That's good. Yeah, yeah so we, yeah. we put that information in the guidebook at the bequest of the uh, the Yellowstone Park Magistrate. A lot of good stuff in the guidebook. And, you know, one thing I've noticed when the Park Service talks about, puts out a press release about these incidents of people, these Turons, and even if they get hurt, they're not very sympathetic because these are wild animals. And people, you should know you got to stay away from these animals. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, it's, um, it's amazing, yeah, I, I mean, last year, at the start of the year, there was a, a, a lady that walked off the boardwalk over there, kind of by Grand Geyser, and, uh, literally just walked out there and, and, started petting a bison like it like it was a labrador retriever laying on the ground and oh and uh and her friends she's back there posing for a picture and then walks back on the boardwalk and walks off it's yeah. it's, it's amazing well and mark came home the other day we're in my day and said <laughs> something yeah. had happened to 399's uh cub they had yes. euthanized one of the four cubs and yeah. it made me so mad because we've been following her since the first time we um, well, went out they're, there. they're like what two and a half years old now. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we saw them a big time like two years ago up in in Grand Teton. Um, I, I don't think they go up to Yellowstone, but uh, no, 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 you, you know there. all about 399 and her cubs, don't you? Yes. Yeah. The most the most famous bears in the world. I, I I said in one of my podcasts, I said if Yogi Bear came to life and started selling cupcakes on a street corner, he'd take second place to that bear. And her four cubs. <laughs> uh, second place. Yeah, That's he, true. He would. That's uh, true. But uh, yeah, I, you know, there's a couple things that that always bothered me with that. And two years ago, when you guys first saw her, um, there was a there was a group of women from Jackson Hole that would come up and just drive up and down this section of road where she had her den and those four cubs. And uh, basically, when somebody saw her coming, they would pull their car over, you know, and there's 500 cars, you know, everybody sees her coming a mile away in those four cubs, and, but they would go up, they'd pull on a, a yellow safety vest out of the trunk of their car, like that made them official park employees and bear management people, and, but they, they, every time they would do this, and this is on a daily basis, they would get within five or ten feet, and even sometimes closer to the bear and those four cubs. And that was and, before the park rangers showed up, I imagine. Uh, even at then, because the, there there were so many people, you get four or five hundred cars out there, and there's you know, like I say, the rangers are so strapped. The rangers We've are busy trying to yes. busy times. trying to get people moving and all this kind of stuff. And these women would wherever the bears cross, you know, they didn't cross where the women were. The women went where the bears are going to cross, and said, you know, everybody stay back. We've got this under control and all this kind of stuff. Well, this happened every day, seven days a week for two seasons and that that habituated those bears to humans especially the cubs the cubs weren't afraid of humans because of that situation and i looked some stuff up after we, we spoke yesterday and um you know the pro one of the problem was was that and that nothing ever happened to those women because you know if a, a guide when i had my guide card if i got within 10 feet or five or ten feet of a bear 
I was going to lose my, I'd lose my guy card or maybe, uh, yeah, pay a $5,000 fine and maybe spend three or four days in jail. But nothing mm -hmm. happened to these women ever. And so, you know, the, as we spoke yesterday, you know, one of the bears had to be put down. And one of those women that lived in, let me look at my notes real quick, um, in the Solitude Division, I looked this up, the Solitude Division is up by Jackson Hole Golf and Tennis Club. It's at the north end of Jackson Hole over there. But she has been feeding that mother bear and those four cubs for year, two years now. And uh, shame. Yeah, it's, 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 that is a big time deal that that she should be in jail for at least 30 days and she should be in, in, in michelle I remember when i told you last year this is not going to end well, well for yeah. these, oh, because yeah. these these um 399 and her cubs were all over the place in town going through trash celebrities people in the lady feeding them like that and that's not going to end well and they had to euthanize one because i yes. guess there was conflicts with with humans yeah, that's exactly right. It, it just kept coming back and kept coming back. And see, that's another thing that you guys bring up is, but yeah, this the, the, the basically this lady got a slap on the hand. Don't do it anymore. And mm -hmm. that that that's just not an that's not enough of a deterrent. But you guys got to you guys got to remember that Jackson Hole per capita is the wealthiest county in the United States. By but not nothing even close. I mean. You think about all the wealthy play Beverly Hills, <laughs> second place to Jackson Hole, but they do not require and they do not have bear-proof trash cans throughout the entire town, and there's only twelve thousand people that live in Jackson Hole, so which is astounding to me. You can't tell me that they can't afford to put in bear-proof trash cans and require all their residents to have bear-proof trash cans. We've had them in West Yellowstone for thirty-five years. Every trash can yeah, in West they're, Yellowstone they're is bare. All over the other parks. Yeah, mm -hmm. big, at big Sky and uh, mm -hmm. at uh, excuse me, at, at, Yeah, everywhere. But Bozeman, mm -hmm. the entire population of Bozeman has bare proof trash cans, but Jackson mm -hmm. Hole for some reason does not. And uh, you got to do something, Teddy. You got to do something to change that. <laughs> I run for yeah. my, my dad was friends with the perpetual mayor of Jackson Hole for 25 years, Dick Allen. He he didn't even have to run yeah. for office. They just keep re kept reelecting him. But but yeah, I, I I just find that amazing that Jackson Hole, with all their wealth, I mean their Boy Scout troops, the wealthiest Boy Scout troop in America, <laughs> because they collect all the antlers that in the in the valley down there and sell them online. And uh, but yeah, they they. they don't have bear-proof trash cans, don't require their residents to have bear-proof trash cans, and that has contributed to the death of one of the cubs of, of uh, Bear 399. Yeah, it's so sad. So sad. I'd ask Mark, with the, why can't they take a, a, a bear like that and put it in you know, somewhere sanctuary and, and save it? Why do they have to euthanize it? Well, I agree with that completely. And see, like that's, that is where they get bears at the Grizzly Discovery Center in West Yellowstone. And the Grizzly yeah. Discovery Center in West Yellowstone, you know, everybody fought that guy tooth and nail about 30 years ago when he was trying to open that up. And because, uh, you know, everybody just thought, he, you know, he built a, an IMAX in that Grizzly Discovery Center. But what he did was he took bears just like that that mm -hmm. had been hit by a car or injured and they'd nurse it back to health or a bear that had been habituated to human food that they were going to kill, he, they would take that bear. They would have gladly taken that bear. They've, yeah. uh, the, and the Grizzly Discovery Center has turned out to be the top bear recovery, wolf recovery, bald eagle recovery center in the world. Uh, it, it's really a nice deal. Not only does the guy, you know, if you go into Yellowstone Park and you get shut out from uh, seeing a bear and your kids are in the back seat crying on the way out of the gate and everything else, well, you can just make a left turn and be a hero and go show them a bunch of bears up close and wolves up close and all that stuff. And, uh, That's you know, where my get, sister went. Get out, of the, get, get out of the ditch with your kids and your wife and uh, show them some bears that are, you know, in Yellowstone Park. But, yeah, they could have taken that bear up there but there's I have read a lot of stuff where everybody was just going you know they were going to euthanize that bear no matter what and that's really wow. sad because those are the four most famous cubs in the history yep. of beardom if you want to say yeah they were fun to watch we love to see the bears out in the wild and we've had a few bear encounters and getting back up to the Lamar Valley of Yellowstone there, remember, Michelle, the, the encounter we had there? Oh, yeah. It was a cinnamon black bear. So pretty. And, nice. and she was being chased by a coyote. And here's another clip from our, our podcast from last year. Yeah. 
This is where we saw the, the bear. Don't mind my butt. <laughs> twice yesterday. And I bet he's back because they're looking right at the same spot in the berry spot. So he was in a berry coma yesterday. And everybody's out here looking oh, yeah, for the got, bear. I'm, it's it's a, I put my a shoes cinnamon on. black bear. And he's in the same spot again. I've got these really nifty sandals. That I so wear. I'm going to I'm going to stop right here. And make, then the buffalo's over there. That's yeah, funny. Yeah. Okay. There'd be a bison over here, bear right here. And I'm going to put my flashers on. If they want to go around me, they can go around me. Mark has been the biggest rebel this week, and you know why? You know uh -huh. why? Because nobody knows him. Yeah. That's the best. Doesn't care. Yeah. He doesn't care. Yeah. Hey, don't you work for Chelton? I don't hear any of that here. Nope. Yeah. It's great. Uh -oh. I get the real mark. So he does. This little bear is running away from the coyote. He doesn't like the coyote. I can only fit a couple people in my van. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was incredible because that coyote was chasing that bear just to right next to our, mm -hmm. our van. And I talked to the ranger and she said that uh, bears are terrified of these coyotes. That's too funny. That's <laughs> and impressive. It, That's amazing. And the bear climbed the tree and the coyote just went by. It was, That's it was amazing. almost like a cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. But, but we love seeing that stuff. I'm sure in the, the decades that you, in all the trips you've had to Yellowstone, and Grand Teton, you've had a, a, an encounter or two with a bear. Oh, I've, I've seen uh, 60 or 80 bears out backpacking and hiking and all that stuff out of the car. And uh, I'll tell you guys something. Uh, um, but generally, when you guys see a bear out in the backpacking and people are scared of that, they're generally just over there turning over rocks, looking for in insects and stuff over and just... You know, don't pay you any mind. Just you know, you want to give them a give them a wide berth. Give them a couple hundred yards. You're only supposed to give them a hundred yards. And, and let them know give you're them there, two. right? Don't yeah, sneak yeah. up on them. Yeah, don't. If you come around a corner, a blind corner, you're supposed to who bear, who bear, and all that. And and uh, you know, have, have you ever had to on. use bear spray? Never. Not even close. Never. Never. But you carry it all the time, I imagine. Uh, Lisa does. My girlfriend does. She she. I I I I'm all. I just I I think we're got we're good. I think uh, you know. I never really worried about it. But uh, promise you, my girlfriend's carrying a couple canisters on both hips, so she's we good do to too. go. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle, what's what's her joke? You know, oh. if I'm. If a bear comes, um, I, I I grab my what first? Oh, he got, grabs his camera. Right. Yes, always, <laughs> always first. <laughs> but you're getting back to get the get you out in front of him a little bit. <laughs> I, I just I just have to be as as fast as. Uh, faster than Mark. Right. That's I'm right. Don't That's want to be the right. slowest one, right? I was pretty fast in high school too, so I got some feet. I got some legs underneath me. I can get going pretty good. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and and another reason we go up to Lamar Valley, and we have a, a Facebook friend who lives in Oklahoma City. Yeah, he does. And uh, I don't know if you know him, Tim Clay. Yep, no, no, no. And uh, he he tells us you got to go up to Lamar Valley to see wolves because we yeah. want to go up. You know, we want to see wolves, and of course that's probably the premier spot. It was so in the worth country, it. maybe the world to see mm -hmm. wolves. The reason we came up here was to see a wolf. We saw, Check we saw, that off our bucket list. I saw, I spotted a black wolf. I didn't know it was a black wolf. I was just looking at this bison way out. 
and I quarter see quarter to half a mile away. And I have these binoculars, so um, anyways. Everyone's got these scopes that go way out there. You have some binoculars. Yeah. I have a nice lens, but you know. He was so big that you couldn't not see him, even from as far away as I was. But um, he was running towards this bison, and um, I mean, I, there's no way he would get the bison, right, unless it was hurt. Um, but he went way past it. He gave us a pretty good show, so I could watch him for a while. So, and then we could hear him howling, howling. That was a highlight because it was so loud and scary, to tell you the truth. I thought it was pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty rad. <laughs> it was swell. Yeah, Ruby. <laughs> There's nothing more eerie than hearing the wolf in the background. Oh, that, yeah. You know, just that, that howl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's amazing. I loved it. It's uh, the, along with yeah. the uh, the elk call in the fall, that crazy elk call in the fall. Uh, not not that dog call, but the, that elk call. Yeah, the dog call. <laughs> <laughs> he's, yeah. he's not allowed in the national park. Yeah, for that's sure. right. But that elk yeah. call, you know, you can see those elk bugle, uh, you know, between, uh, right there between Madison Junction as you're heading back towards uh, uh, West Yellowstone in the fall. That is the spot to hear those elk bugle in the fall starting about. September 15th, 18th right there, they'll start setting up those harems up and down through there on those the upper and lower valley right through there. That's a good time to go to the park, isn't it? September. It's, it's fabulous. The, I, the, the I head back. I avoid July and August like like the plague, and we usually go to Europe or somewhere and do mess around and do something. But uh, the uh, the fall is this you know September right after September 1st, the crowds just start plummeting downhill because everybody's got to get their kids back in school. And, uh, yeah, and, and the weather's and the, still good. The weather gets Decent, cooler yeah. and better, and and uh, and the and the Beckler area of Yellowstone Park comes into its own. Um, I don't know if you guys are, are walkers or hikers, but you know the seldom seen Beckler area. Less than one percent of the of the visitors to Yellowstone Park ever get down to the Beckler area, which is in the southwest corner. It's called Cascade Corner because eighty percent of the park's waterfalls are down there. And that is the place to go hiking and walking, and, and there's never anybody there. You'll go park in the parking lot. You might see five cars, but it is the Beckler area comes into its own in the fall. In fact, the cover shot for our guidebook was taken at Union Falls, and you could go hot potting down there, and uh, there's tons of day hikes. And the Beckler area of Yellowstone Park is, is by far the prettiest part of Yellowstone Park, but very few people see it. But in September, that is the time to get down into Beckler. What, what do you think all this devastation, especially up in the northeast part of Yellowstone, what kind of impact effect is it having on the wildlife, the bison, the bears, the wolves? Uh, what do you, what do you think is going on there without all the people there? The roads are out. Of course, they don't need the roads, but you know all the flooding did it did it hurt the wildlife up there? No, I think it's a beneficial. I, I think it keep it keeps the, the the what's the word you guys use the the turons the turons the, turons, the, the turons. turons yeah the the turons <laughs> away from everything and especially in that Lamar Valley. Uh, Lisa and I were in the Lamar Valley before the the flooding hit about three days before. And I, I had never seen more bison in the in the upper and lower Lamar valleys. I bet we counted ten thousand bison in the valleys up through there, and uh, it, it was just incredible. And uh, I'd, I'd never seen that many bison up there. And so they're up there all alone. The wolves are up there all alone, and and uh, they're able to to go wherever they want now because they're not scared of those humans, and they're because the humans aren't there. So I think it's I think it's a, a beneficial deal. And one thing we were talking about earlier about the bears I forgot to mention to you guys is um, you know there's when I was a kid growing up you couldn't basically drive from the lower basin which is the uh, the northern basin first basin you come to in when you're driving from Mad Madison Junction down to Old Faithful um, about halfway down from there to Old Faithful that seven mile stretch of road used to be called Bear Alley and uh, you couldn't drive that section of road and not see bears. I mean, it was just a given. And uh, I mean, I tell one of the old stories that the last year we saw bears, which was in the mid 70s, you guys got to remember it was legal to feed a bear in Yellowstone Park up until I think 1977. I've, you, I've seen pictures. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we used to, but we'd buy, my mom would make sandwiches to feed bears out of the window of our car. What yeah. did they like? 
They just came out the car and started eating a sandwich out of your hand. It was it was nuts. And uh, peanut butter, but, butter burn jelly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever Yogi likes. And so, but we were driving through. Me and my cousin Freddie, who was the biggest screw up on planet Earth, and uh, God rest his soul. And uh, but we were driving through. We'd have everything to do up at Henry's Lake, and we were driving. Up, we're going to go catch Grand Go Off or something like this. And we were driving through, and big bear jam. And there's a ranger out there trying to get cars going. And there's two two black bears out. There, so we're you know get up past the ranger, and there's a big black bear right in the middle of the road. I'll never forget as long as I live. This guy, you know, he's out there. He's got some little camera. He's got about a four-year-old son sitting next to him. We watched him unwrap a Baby Ruth candy bar, and he throws it down on the ground in front of that bear. And that bear comes over and smells that, and he and he reaches over and he gets his son and he puts him on the back of that black bear and steps back and goes click. Click and and that ranger spins. My cousin Freddie goes, "What are you doing?" And that ranger oh spins God. around and goes, "Oh my God!" You know, and just he goes grabs that kid off that bear, and the guy goes, "What?" You know, he it was it was such commonplace to feed wow. bears, but I've, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, my cousin Freddie was the biggest screw up ever, and he's yelling at the guy. I'm nine years old. I'm yelling at the guy. The ranger did, but that was it. That, that that was the last year we saw bears, and I bet I haven't seen since 1977, let's say, and until this year. I haven't seen a bunch of uh, bear, commonplace bears on there in, what would that be, 40-something years? But there is a bear wow. that has showed up this spring uh, right there between the Ferry Falls parking lot and the Biscuit Basin parking lot, which is about a two-mile section of road. There's a little female grizzly bear. And, I mean, she's not very big. She's about the size of a husky dog. She's small. She probably doesn't weigh 200 pounds. And she has had a, a cub that is the size of a stuffed doll about 20 inches by 15 or 18 inches tall and she has got a den over there set up right near the road and I've driven through there 10 times this spring and I've seen her five and uh, yeah so there is a new bear on on the prowl right through there and she's tiny she's a little grizzly bear and then she's got this little cub it's the cutest thing i've ever seen in my life i've never oh, wow. seen a cub so small i've never seen a mama grizzly so small she's smaller than a black a, a medium-sized black bear but wow. that is something your listeners ought to look for with anybody that's going to yellowstone park including you guys you know between the fairy falls parking lot south to the biscuit basin parking lot north of old faithful and uh, she's right there. You're, you got about a 50-50 shot of seeing her and that little cub, and, it, and it's incredible. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I can just hear the wheels turning in Mark's head right now. Yeah. You know what? You know what I'm gonna say. Glacier's a long ways, you guys. <laughs> he's, he's gonna cancel that trip. I'm telling you right now. I, I you know, I, I, I'll check it out. I'm telling you, yeah. Yellowstone Park this year. And see, that's the other problem about going somewhere like Glacier, the Grand Canyon, or Zion, or everything else. That's where everybody else is going because they're, they think Yellowstone yeah. Park's closed. So those those other areas are just going to be inundated with people. You so. know, I grew up going to Yosemite. You know, oh, yeah. I've been to Yosemite yeah. since, I, since before I was born. My parents would go with their friends and take my brothers and sisters and everybody. So I would go there every single year at Labor Day, and we would stay up in um, Wawona. Oh, nice. So um, kind of far removed from just the valley. My, my dad and, and his friends, would they hated going down to the valley floor. You know, because of all the turons, but um, there were quite a few bear up there. Yeah, there is. There is quite a few bears up there. I hope all those fires get taken care of up there because those are sure. I know. Yeah, the you know. Yeah, you know, and and, and the fires, and we uh, talk about the floods there at Yellowstone. You know, as as humans, we're disappointed. We're upset because maybe our favorite campsite or fishing hole, or or whatever may not be there but it's all part of mother nature and this happens whether it's fires or or floods and yellowstone will survive won't it oh absolutely no doubt about it yeah it, it's uh yeah we are are inundating mother nature you know mother you know mother nature is on display in yellowstone park like no other place with the animals and the water and the geysers shooting out of the ground and the boiling mud it, there's no place like it on earth it's uh, it's simply incredible and uh you know whether we're here or not, it uh, it doesn't really matter. I, I'm convinced that the park's going to have to do something with the traffic, and um, you know because 
uh, one of the Bears 399 Cubs down in Grand Teton, I guess right after, right before the uh, one of the Cubs had to get euthanized, her Cub that she had this year with another male got hit by a car last week. And so that's mm. just too bad. And she only had that one Did Cub. Die? That's, yeah, died. Yeah, got hit by a car and uh-huh. died. But I, I just yeah. convinced that they've got to do something. They tried buses about 15 years ago without telling anybody, and it just didn't work. But I, I, I'm convinced that the, maybe they need to do a, a tram system where they get above the ground a little bit and do a, a tram system which gets people through the park and allows the, the animals to traverse under the park, under the roads and everything else. If you could transport people through Yellowstone Park without their cars like they do in Zion then uh, yeah. and allow the animals you know, to fly. People love their cars. I know, I know. but if you could, if but you could do it did, right, Zion. yeah, if you could do it right and uh, have you know a number of stops and all this kind of stuff, and do it on a, a, a tram system above the ground, allow the animals to walk underneath, uh, and and stop and allow the migratory routes, because there's nothing worse than getting stuck in a bison jam when you pull into Yellowstone Park for for three hours <laughs> and you're stuck behind. Ten thousand cars, and you're, you know. Yeah, and as long you, as I have my van, I'm okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can understand the locals, especially getting stuck in a bison jam or oh, a yeah. three ninety nine siding like that, um, because they want to go from point A to point B, and yes. the Turons are on the way. Us tourists, um, you know, we love it. We love seeing. You know, even yeah. if you get caught in the traffic jam. Well, I just I try. get my camera out and I get my picture. And yeah. but we work hard. When we go there, Teddy, we're not like the normal tourists. Like, we will get up. At 5 o'clock every morning because that's when the, we like the to, animals we, are up. Yeah, we like to do that. And then, yep. you know, then we won't get stuck with all the traffic jams and stuff. We well, that's where I go in. That. Yeah, we hit the gate by mm-hmm. 5.30 yeah. or 6 every day. And, and uh, we get in and get out early and uh, avoid all the all the crowds and all the traffic. Yeah, I know. So that's that, that's your, probably your biggest advice for tourists is to get going early before those, yep. especially those tour buses come in. Right? Yeah, get in the park early and know where you're going. You know, you can't just go in Yellowstone Park and wing it. You've got to. You're going to go to the canyon area and go to the falls and see all that. Then go to the canyon area. If you're going to go to the canyon and the lake area, then you know you're going to go to the lake area and tie that in together. And that's you you, you just can't do it. Yellowstone Park will eat you eat you alive if you let it. There's just no doubt about it. If you try to pull up too much off in one day, and you got you got to know where you're going and then go do what you want to go do. Have a great time and then and then get out before all the traffic gets out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, as you just said, Yellowstone is like no other place on earth, and there's no other uh, better person to tell us about Yellowstone than Teddy Garland. You've been there for so long, and you know this park inside out and where to go, when to go. we got to uh, get that book. What to see. The book yeah. will help. So once yeah, again, absolutely. it's um, ex- explore Yellowstone like a local. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, but, but like a local, think about this. Remember the podcast you did about... Um, being down in Jackson, and you would say that you could spot a tourist oh, by the way they were dressed. <laughs> they're all wearing uh, all the tags are still hanging off the hats, so they're they're yeah. easy to spot. I promise you. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, take that tag right? off that Her hat. Stetson. I got and, my hat. Yeah. I only I, I live in Oklahoma. Well, that's I don't okay. wear that hat here. Yeah. yeah. Take that tag all off right. that hat before you go sit down for that three-hour lunch. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. Teddy Garland, thanks very much. We'll be listening to your podcast, Explore Yellowstone Like a Local, and pick up your guidebook. We'll put all that information in our show notes. I would but, appreciate uh, it. That is, thanks for having me yeah. on. I really appreciate it. Maybe we should do this again yeah, sometime. We look forward to a good year um, in Yellowstone, whether we're there or not. So Sounds great. I know you'll be there. I'll be there. I'll, if you guys, if you guys do there. come, I will, I'll meet you guys there. We'll have a good time. That'd be great. All right. 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 Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much. We hope you've enjoyed our podcast and thank you for spending your time with us. We'll see you next time for another episode of Let's Talk.